One and all, welcome in week six. This week, we're going to focus on some advanced topic related to personal selection, the use of different instruments to select candidates. Agenda for this week is as follows. First of all, we are going to discuss problem of globalization and uh, to what extent that influences validity, specifically external validity. Then we are going to discuss test and item equivalence. How we can simplify the procedure of test use by using adaptive testing, computer adaptive testing. Then in the next part we are going to discuss how we can develop an instrument using IRT, item response theory. I will describe briefly use of method, statistical procedures that can be utilized later on in order to develop an uh, instrument. Then in the next part, we are going to focus on the use of games in personal selection. This topic will be only touched because more detail will be described in the Gas Lecture by Art Barnes. And finally, in the final part of this week, I'm going to focus on what and how to prepare for week 6 work group. Okay, let's start. In this part, I'm going to discuss problems related to external validity or specific problems that are related to validity as a whole, so equivalence. As you probably are aware, there is a huge impact of globalization on personal selection procedures. For instance, we use methods that could uh, be developed in the United States, or people in the United States use methods that are developed in Europe. The same exchange can happen between other parts of the world. So we can ask a question, to what extent methods that are used here and now can be used also in the other countries? To what extent validity of those methods is the same for other samples? It's a huge challenge for personal selection as a whole, because Current companies, they of course function in different parts of the world and that has strong impact on the quality of the methods and also conclusions that can be derived from findings obtained using those methods. Let's take a look at one of the examples of how personal selection methods can be used. This example, that I will show you in a second, was uh, developed a couple of years ago by a group of students who thought that in the current globalized world, the use of internet, the use of uh, phone apps can be a very um, nicely implemented into personal selection. The project is called Virtual Recruiter. Let's take a look at how this app works. 
this app, it shows a potential in uh, visual recruiting. The uh, first phase of this app uh, was designed to help uh, potential employees to prepare for an interview. The idea was that uh, people install this app, they use it, answer to specific questions, later on they uh, get the feedback from, uh, from a human being via the app and they know what they could improve uh, while um, uh, participating in a typical uh, job interview. Of course, this kind of app could be also used for other purposes. It could be used to recruit specific um, uh, candidates. So for instance, nowadays, um, a potential employee doesn't have to attend a specific interview, uh, doesn't have to go to a company. All can be done um, via online. In our uh, section, uh, people work currently on a project that are designed to automatize even a personality assessment using this kind of app. What they need from this kind of project is to uh, uh, record voice, uh, how people behave in front of camera, how they respond to questions. So based on this data, those people, they want to diagnose a personality. So as you see, this kind of apps can on, not only help people to train to prepare for job interviews, can help companies to recruit particip uh, participants or candidates, but of course that can also can be used to some extent for personality uh, measurement. That's a really fantastic way of using those kind of apps. But when you think about using those apps, here uh, in Netherlands, we also need to take into account that there can be some differences uh, between countries, between different populations. It's also important when you take into account that maybe there are also differences uh, in results and also to some extent there can be a different effects on validity if we use internet uh, using a paper and pencil for instance or when we use a test over internet. When that happens, so when test is distributed via internet or novel methods to test personality are implemented, for instance diagnosing personality via online apps or phone apps or if tests are used in different countries, we need to take into account the process of adaptation. Each method needs to be adapted to specific conditions, language, and also, of course, to culture. When a new methods are developed, there's always a need to prepare appropriate adaptation to country, to language. Thus, adequate comparisons need to make, be made between different methods. So a researcher, so a person that develops a specific method, needs to make specific comparisons, needs to test equivalence of those methods. And finally, specific normalization needs to be made. Different, probably different for uh, each uh, region, each country, in, uh, language, or subpopulations. That's really important to take that into account. In order to obtain high level of external validity, those three elements need to be fulfilled. Adequate adaptation, appropriate comparison, and of course, local normalization. When we talk about equivalence, it's really important to remember that we have three types of equivalence. We have equivalence that is related to construct, 
concert equivalence is related to uh, this kind of situation that we need to make sure that the test measure the same construct in all groups. In this case, it matters when we, for instance, create a test that can be used in different countries. So by applying specific statistical methods, we need to make sure that in each sample, in each country, a test has the same structure, measure the same number of dimensions. So for instance, if we would like to create a personality measure or invent a new method to measure personality via online methods, we should be able to obtain the same uh, structure, the same factorial structure in all countries. Then we have metric equivalence related to measures. It's defined that a test measures the same construct in all groups using the same response scale. That's pretty vague. But basically, it's related to the same factor loadings. So for instance, if you would like to create a measure to uh, assess personality, and you will uh, claim that personality has three specific factors, then in all samples, in all populations, let's say Netherlands versus United States, if you would claim metric equivalence, factor loadings, so correlations between item and a factor in all countries should be the same. Why it's important? It's important because a factor load, loading reflects importance of specific item uh, for dimension. If the importance of those items for dimensions are the same in the same in different populations, then you can claim metric equivalence. Then you can say that, yeah, we did this comparisons um, between uh, samples, and we proved that uh, the test can give the same results uh, if used in different countries. And finally, we have scalar equivalence. It's related to score. Specifically, a test measures the same construct in all groups using the same response scale with the same measurement units. Uh, it's related to um, statistical term, the same intercept. Basically, it means that it's related to differences between countries. So you would expect that both versions of a test are equivalent if there are no substantial differences between the scores between those countries, between populations. Because at the theory level, uh, there is no need to assume that, for instance, country B has a different level or, or people in country B has a different level in, um, than in uh, people um, in country uh, A, for instance. So we cannot assume uh, differences between two countries or more if we test specific uh, tests in different countries. Okay, let's take a look at equivalence also from a different perspective. At this point, we know that we have equivalence related to construct, to measurement, and also to score. At this point, when testing equivalence of specific uh, tests, instruments in different populations, testing for those aspects is really important. When we apply tests in different populations, we need to remember that we may distinguish between two types of instruments. First type is uh, when maximum performance matters, 
so uh, when we use cognitive tests. And the second type of uh, instrument is uh, related to typical performance. So that's personality test. If there's no equivalence between subpopulations, that may affect both type of tests, specifically maxima performance test and typical performance test. What also matters is that how we distribute specific tests. If you use uh, paper, if you use internet, that both can affect overall scores. So, if you would like to use different versions of the methods, so it's really important to test equivalence when paper test is used and compare that to a version if a test is distributed via internet. That's important. So testing for those three types of equivalence would be important at this point. It matters because depending on the method that we use, we can experience different uh, errors. So for instance, one of the most important source of error is faking. As a model by Ayala showed, there are a few ways to decrease faking. We can uh, decrease faking when we remind people about standards, values, rules. Visibility. So if people know that they are observed, that decreases faking. And also engagement. So uh, if people sign a specific code of conduct, that heavily increases their honesty and, of course, decreases faking. Think for a second, to what extent those kind of conditions can be fulfilled when, for instance, um, a test is distributed via internet? Is it possible to be able to observe whether a participant is faking their responses or not? Are there any differences between distribution via paper or via internet in terms of which procedure decreases or increases faking. What also matters for equivalence is that whether a specific method is a performance measure, where we can assess how actually a person performs. So for instance, you can measure personality by seeing how people perform specific tasks. This is what we can do, for instance, in games, if games are used to assess personality. Or you compare that to self-report. Then you can ask a question. To what extent those two versions uh, of instrument to measure personality are equivalent? How we can prove that they are equivalent? And let's focus finally on items. When we talk about the equivalence of items, we take into account a whole test. And we can ask a question, to what extent a specific item discriminates between people with high or low ability? So for instance, you distribute a cognitive test. And then a test has uh, multiple items. Then you could ask a question, to what extent item A, B, C, and so on are equivalent to each other. To what extent they measure the same construct? That's important problem. When we test for equivalence of items, we take into account distribution of scores and we analyze distribution of the scores. If Two items give normal distribution and third item gives non-normal distribution. Typically, it means that, that those items are not fully equivalent. To some extent, 
uh, two items, first two items, and uh, offer different distribution of ability if compared to the third item. That's a problem that can be tackled properly when we have data and we can implement IRT analysis, item response theory. That can nicely explain to the problem what's the equivalence of specific items. Also, when we use a specific test and we use this uh, test in parts, we can also use a question to what extent parts of these tests, so for instance, a set of five items uh, and a set of another five items, to what extent they can be used equivalently. So for instance, if you would like to simplify the process of personal selection and uh, one time use five items and then another time another five items, to what extent those measurements would be equivalent. And finally, if you distribute performance test, what also matters is difficulty. So for instance, you measure specific uh, cognitive abilities. At this point, not only validity matters, but also how difficult are those uh, parts of the test. Because if maximum performance matters, it's also really important that if test is separate into parts, that um, all parts can assess this maximum uh, level equivalent. The problem of equivalence is really important when we use uh, a procedure called adaptive testing. Because in adaptive testing, typically we use only part of the test. The, way, the reason why we do that is first of all, to some extent, to speed up the process of measurement, to some extent, simplify it. Okay, let's consider adaptive testing. Adaptive testing in personality measurement, specifically in personal selection, is not often used. Typically, we use, for instance, the whole questionnaire of Hexaco, because if we use parts of the test, we may not adequately measure personality. So, for instance, if you use only two or three items from Hexaco, maybe the content validity of this subset is not good enough in order to assess personal personality overall. But still, those adaptive testing methods are pretty fine if we uh, use them for assessing different abilities, for instance, cognitive abilities. If adaptive testing is used, that can nicely simplify the process of testing different cognitive abilities. Let's take a look at details related to adaptive testing in personal selection. Typically, adaptive testing is a computer-based method. We assume that this method is more objective if compared to a procedure performed by a person, diagnostician. We apply different items and application of specific items depend on uh, participant response. It means that when a person correctly responds to item that is distributed as, as the first one, then more difficult item can be given if specific cognitive ability is tested. Computer assumes that you can start from the middle level of difficulty. If a candidate responds correctly to this item, then more difficult item is given. If again a correct response is given, then more difficult item is provided. 
and this process continues. If a candidate makes a mistake, then more easy item is given. If a candidate makes a set of specific mistakes, process is stopped and uh, assessment uh, is made. That may save a lot of time. Instead of distribution of the whole test that can have, let's say, 20 items, only 10 items can be presented uh, to the candidate. And still, the assessment of specific trade is, can be really accurate. As you probably know from uh, previous uh, slides, from previous lectures, contextualization can help to improve validity. To some extent, if we provide context, so for instance, items become more ipsative, more descriptive, and then participants are requested to uh, choose one of the options that provide detailed description of potential behavior, to some extent that can prevent faking. On the other hand, if ipsative tests are used, responding to those items takes a lot of time. So if a situation judgment test, for instance, that is descriptive, is presented to candidates, typically 10 or 15 items can be presented. It takes a lot of time to respond to this kind of items. So researchers, they've tried to test whether ipsative methods, more descriptive, can also be used during adaptive testing. And depending on responses of candidates, uh, specific procedures can be created for uh, the use of uh, this kind of tests. Since we know that only a small number of items can be presented if those items are in ipsative, then adaptive testing that allows us to select specific items and differentiate very easily throughout the whole process uh, regarding the level of a trait of a candidate, then it's a perfect procedure for application of ipsative items because adaptive testing typically uses a small portion of items. Then, combination of adaptive testing and ipsative testing is a perfect combination to swiftly and accurately assess the level of specific traits. Because adaptive testing utilizes less items, can be more effective and it's more effective because less items are used. Thus, can be also cheaper. It may take less time compared to non-adaptive testing to conclude level of a specific trait. For instance, uh, cognitive capacity or related to cognitive capacity or to personality. As a consequence, if a computer are used, that limits personnel that is required. Because if a procedure can be nicely programmed, so we can create our algorithm to assess uh, a level of specific trait, that can simplify the whole process, less people are required to uh, be involved. This procedure is, uh, this procedure is uh, uh, effective, cheaper, because of course, uh, it's shorter, but this problem is not free of different problems. Typical problems when computers are involved is faking, because it's more anonymous, people are not watched, less engaged, um, rules are not so often reminded to them. What also matters is experience because it was shown that if a candidate is more experienced in this kind of testing, uh, he or she may get high scores. Also, what matters is how candidates perceive uh, this kind of process. 
There are concerns that if adaptive testing is used, candidates may not perceive that as fair. Nevertheless, given the typical problems, still this adaptive testing procedure is really attractive and shall be considered in the future in personal selection. But 